Now we're going to hear a lot about bodies quite soon, because our next guest is a, a literary scholar and cultural scientist, or simply an author, whose influence can hardly be overstated, especially here in Germany. It's also hard to introduce his work because he has been enormously productive and his subject range is very wide, especially for a German scholar. Because he connected dots between the disciplines before anyone in academia could even spell interdisciplinary in this country. And um, he probably to this day remains one of the most critical readers of journalism. Many of his books quote media coverage extensively, which makes me cringe a little bit as a journalist. Uh, puts me into fear, so to speak, but fear is uh, actually at the core of his talk he's going to give uh, in a minute. But let me start a very general introduction like this. His work is seminal in that he put the body at the core of not only male studies, something that had not existed before him, the body is also central in his studies on excessive violence. More than a thousand pages in two volumes of male fantasies, Männerfantasien in German, changed the way we think about violence, war, genocide. Well, let us say some of us talk less about ideology or religion since. Uh, and more about sex or gender and their relation to the fascist personality, which is male. Male Fantasies was first published in 1977 and 1978. In a couple of months, there will be yet another edition in the two volumes at Matheson Sites in Berlin. A prominent German speaker living in Freiburg in the south of the Republic has written about colonization too and about the role of the female victim, especially in Buch der Königstöchter, but also on contemporary pop culture and jazz, on Jimi Hendrix, and on football or soccer if you're American. While male fantasies dealt with the Körperpanzer, as he calls it, the body armor of the terrified and then terrifying male fascist personality that emerged in and after World War I in the Weimar Republic up to the Nazi regime, his book Das Lachen der Täter, Breivik und Andere, Psychogramm der Tötungslust, Klammer, Unruhe bewahren, Klammer zu, attempt of a translation, the offender's laughter, Breivik and others. That book offers many echoes of the book of male fantasies and again tries to reject the myth that terror or violence is about ideologies. Much more likely, it is about bodies, about child bodies too. Psychoanalysis is an important tool for his work, but so are sociology, history, and cultural anthropology. His talk today is called The Fragmented Body, Feeling Free Through Violence. Extremely pleased to have him here with us today. Please welcome Klaus Teweleit. Is Mike better? Probably. Yes, thank you, Toby, for the introduction and Susanne Pfeffer for the invitation, which I admitted gladly. Yes, we heard about dismembered persons lying at the way. As Hubbard was talking about. We now come close. Just let me have a look at the clock. Close to the body of the people on the other side, not on the side of the victims, <clears throat> the side of the killers. Mainly still male groups <clears throat> or male single persons, assassinators. The first part, I'll make a sort of short summary <clears throat> of what Toby was speaking about, <clears throat> male fantasies. Starting with this point of uh, fear, anxiety, which is a, is a thing that is structuring persons on both sides of the political lines or the gender lines. 
fear and anxiety both are parts of normal human behavior. Without getting anxious when looking into an abyss, no humans ever would have survived to this day. <clears throat> fear of foreigners, normal too. In many cases, newly arriving people were hostile to those living at the places the foreigners entered. But there are human bodies living in a constant fear without being under special threats from the external world. A fear which derives from special emotional states of their own bodies. A fear from the inside. A fear seated in their intestines, in their heart, breast, stomach, their ass, their knees, their head. It's a fear of losing ground under one's feet. A fear that, when it comes to be verbalized, finds expressions for itself like being devoured or swallowed by feeble grounds, over flooded and taken away by mighty waves, or sinking into an abyss of excrements. German Freikorps soldiers in the years of 1919-20 called it Die Rote Flut, the Red Flood, <clears throat> coming to take them away. That name indicates that they were speaking of something raging outside of them. Red Flood to them simply meant the threat of communism, Bolshevism. It was the name they gave to workers on strike or in political demonstrations in the streets. And they felt the urge to stop it before it could seize the political power in the country they called Vaterland Deutschland. They felt the urge <clears throat> to build dams against that flood. What do soldiers do when they want to stop something? They shoot, they fire, then they laugh. The flood, that is the crowd, disappears. The place is empty. Now they get into a heavy laughter. That's one of the steady signs of soldiers having emptied a place. The laughs of the killer. They have to laugh because that crowd, that mass that had threatened to swallow him and his comrades has disappeared, has dissolved. It's a miracle. And he is a wizard with his gun. And wizards are not afraid of anything. He, with his bunch of comrades around him, the military unit, is in power. He is almighty in that moment, so make it last, make it last. <clears throat> and his fiesta is in there laughing. What I have described to you is a typical process within bodies living in unspecified fears. They handle these fears by giving them names from objects or people who are around them in the external reality. For example, rebellious workers who are willing to take control of the state, rebellious students working towards a socialist society, black people longing for a state of their own inside the US, Latino immigrants on their way to make California their homeland or too many yellow people in the country. In Germany, around the year of 1900, Emperor William II steadily fantasized about the Gelbe Gefahr, the danger in yellow, without nearly having any people from China in Germany or whole Europe. Red flood, yellow threat, black currents heading to Washington, countless Muslims all wanting to kill every one honest Christian person here, and so on. In Germany of the 20s, 30s, 40s, the Jews were accused for wanting to seize power over Germany, trying to get control over bank houses, factories, politics, universities, the press, the theaters, the cinema, the warehouses, and so on. Wherever you looked for a place for yourself, there was, so they said, a Jew occupying that place, giving good Germans no space for a living, an omnipresent poisonous flood. This sort of shift in language I realized very clearly when reading the memoirs or reports of those Freikorps soldiers boasting with their deeds of having killed working class people when beating down the German revolution after World War I. Especially proud, their language grew when coming to the point of the most dangerous part of that red flood, working class women under arms. The so-called Flintenweiber rifle women, 
who, so they were writing, carried their guns under their skirts. Their texts enter a mode of celebration when describing how they turned these red whores into a bloody mess. By the way, nobody has ever seen such a rifle woman alive. They only exist in form of this bloody mass after the soldiers have come over them. There are some similar special words they use when dealing with situations of that revolution. For example, there is a group of workers demanding better payment or the eight hour working day. They are commanded to bring such a group to silence, a somehow clear situation of political confrontation. But what do we read in their texts? They were writing things like this. The slimy miasma constantly growing around us had nearly reached the lower lip of our mouths and threatened to cross this border. The fatherland was drowned in bloody swamps or streams of shit, those dirty prostitutes on top. Was it that way that demonstrators looked like? No, not at all. I made a list with the words they used for describing those people in rebellion. Dirt, the mire, the morass, slime, pulp, swamps, shit. Words for rebellious workers and at the same time, words characterizing the substance of the new republic that was to arise after the defeat of the monarchy. The red flood, street of blood, exploding earth, lava, all things able and willing to work on the dissolution of the soldiers' bodies, engulfing them. Reality completely had turned into a swamp-like state. After a while, it became clear to me what they really were speaking about. No stream of shit or bloody morass ever had come to their lips from the external world. <clears throat> they were speaking about themselves. Inside of them, the red flood, the bloody mass of their inner body had grown to the brink of their lips when they were confronted with the political masses in upheaval. They were taking and writing strictly about their own bodies in fear. They felt themselves in danger to be drenched to the bone by their inner feelings. Expressed in psychoanalytical terms, their bodies hadn't developed a clear division between things happening outside of them and inside of them. They mixed the different forms of realities up all the time. That was the first rule or law of fascist language to discover. They are talking of their own bodies all the time. Ernst Jünger's World War I title, Der Kampf als inneres Erlebnis, Battle as Inner Experience, speaks exactly about this. And lecture two, they are mixing up constantly different forms of existing realities to a sort of mesh in their perception that is threatening them. After a while, I defined these states of mind and speaking as hallucinatory. The next discovery to follow was the fact that all those political reality forms working at the bodily dissolution of the soldiers closely were connected with femininity in their writings. So in first line, it was the mud of the lower parts of women's bodies that was the most heavy threat to them. The red, muddy whore, whore because she was willing to let all those dirty mire men fighting for a republic fuck her. The perception of their acting in sorts of hallucinatory states of mind brought me to the point of departure from traditional psychoanalysis. In terms of traditional psychoanalysis, this mixing up of realities <coughs> is named projections. For example, we mix up persons in our mind when we are angry about somebody or when we are drunk. We all do that at special times. A friend who treats me badly for a moment and my unconscious notes, that's the way my father used to treat me, may get a reaction from me that's completely unjust because of the projection of the father figure onto him. Next day, after a good night, I will apologize for that. Reality? Reality principle would be back on my mind. 
That's not what happens with persons who haven't developed secure feelings about their own body borders. They used to stay in sorts of hallucinatory states of mind all the time. The threat of being engulfed by surrounding realities never ceases. But that's not completely exact. There are situations where they seem to come to a bodily balance in a sort of harmonic self-perception. These are, without exceptions, scenes of violence. They get into states of homeostasis when they are killing, and that is especially when killing women. They love to transform the bodies of women into a very special sight or view. Taking a closer look at the manifestations of violent, erotic advances, we find the descriptions of bodily states like these, all quotes now, being gored by a bull's horn, whipping the naked buttocks, uh, buttocks being beaten into a bloody mass with a whip, a bullet in the mouth, being beaten with a rifle butt, or ripped apart with a hand grenade. And they get more detailed killed women, <clears throat> I leave out uh, the names of the authors of those novels or reports, drenched with black blood between hips and thighs, just a monstrous bloody throat where there had once been a face. A female bullfighter who's hit by the bull's horn is a bloody drenched mass, silver and blue, lies in the sand. A bloody mass, a lump of flesh that appears to have been completely lacerated with whips and is now lying within a circle of trampled reddish slush. Another one has a bad girl from Schwabing is beaten until there isn't a white spot left on her back. Tortured women lie naked and cut to pieces in the filth of the street. Her abdomen was crushed, a pulp of blood and excrement, cloth and flesh shoots them all down with machine guns, shred them to pieces and pulverize them with dynamite. And one of them discovers himself to be a poet, enjoying the view of two women killed. Quote, both women lie dead on the floor of their room, their blood exactly the same color as the roses blooming in extravagant profusion outside the window. The effective dominance in writing those things is the pleasurable perception of women in the condition of bloody masses that seems to deliver the real satisfaction. The most frequent words they use for female bodies are dirt, mire, morass, slime, pulp, swamps. The red flood, street of blood, exploding earth, lava, those all together are busy dissolving everything that gave security to the soldiers' bodies. They form a bunch of engulfing realities. It became obvious the women they love to kill cease to exist as bodies, as figures with boundaries. The question was from where stems this lust of performing living flesh into the view of this bloody miasma. That's wh where psychoanalysts of childhood have to enter this scene. It were mostly women, women from the Freudian International Association, <clears throat> stepping a lot ahead of what Freud had discovered, children's sexuality and its Oedipal fate in the growing up of their child. <clears throat> women like Melanie Klein in England <clears throat> and Margaret Mahler coming from Hungary in the US. They realized that the understanding of the basic conditions of the human body has to start at much earlier stages than Freud and co. had proposed. That means directly after birth and sometimes even before in prenatal states. There is a special state of symbiosis between the baby and the maternal body they came to name as dual union. Mahler's book, titled from 1970s, showed the way of a, of a materialist development of the child's body, symbiosis, and individuation. The way of the single child out of this symbiosis, which can be completely horrifying, one, when there is a devouring or rejecting maternal body, depends on the sort of body borders the child is able to develop. 
That depends on how strong the libidinal cathexis of the skin within the baby is growing. Pleasurably cathecting one's own periphery is possible only through ways of loving attention from an external source. The body has to be stimulated to do this work of growth into an emotionally balanced unity. Persons who never attained the security of body borders libidinally invested from within remain in a way incomplete, often heavily disturbed. This kind of staying uncompleted in their early bodily development I tried to capture with the term people not yet fully born. People living in a fragmented, fragmented body as those female psychoanalysts of children named it. Psychoanalyst M. Balland called this the fundamental lack, the Grundstörung. Fragmented bodies all the time are under threat of deorganization. They permanently live on the brink of psychical breakdowns, of losing their countenance, of exploding when under pressure. Their main way of getting out of the state and come out of that state and come to a feeling of wholeness which they constantly lack is the use of violence. Violent acts hold the promise of keeping threatening things down, the promise to eliminate them. By acting immediately against everything that makes them feel uneasy, acting in forms psychoanaly psychoanalysis calls the primary process. Fragmented bodies cannot cope with the changeabilities and complexities. They cannot integrate and cannot synthesize. The, to shelter themselves from the liveliness of life happening around them, fragmented bodies try or are bound to take life out of their surroundings. Mala coined two terms for actions like that she found in her young patients, <coughs> disturbed patients, youth. The act of de-differentiation and the act of de-vivication. Both of them performed violently, both of them in this typical derealized states of mind she called hallucinatory. Violence because their bodies have not developed the ability to get into a somewhat balanced relationship with their surroundings. The ability of integrating outer realities into the own psychic process the ability of working through situations. What Freud had called the reality principle has never grown in them. They never arrive at that state of the person that Freud has defined as the ego of the so-called normal, healthy adult who is able to deal with the realities in the so-called secondary process. To stress the difference of these acts to acts traditional psychoanalysis calls defense mechanisms, Abwehrmechanismen, Mahler found a new term for them. She called them maintenance mechanisms, Erhaltungsmechanismen, dealing with questions of life and death. Secondly, her patients, psychically <clears throat> exploding in those acts, always aimed towards very specific views as the results of their actions. Mahler called these views conglomerates of perception identities. I really was struck when realizing that those terms, one from the psychoanalytic work with heavily disturbed children and adolescents, were fitting to describe and define the actions of the soldiers nearly perfectly. Devivication is a perfect term for the perception identity empty place, De-differentiation, a perfect term for the perception identity, bloody miasma, both groups acting in hallucinatory states of mind. Both of them finding homeostasis only in and through violent acts. Both of them coming to their sort of being alive, feeling free, through taking life out of others or out of reality. To me, it was as if Mahler had developed her terms through studying the actions of those soldierly men. A closer look at the specific forms of childhood experience of the Freikorps soldiers revealed that most of them had suffered heavy beatings during their childhood, suffered from hunger, shouting of the adults, punishments of all sorts <laughs> for so-called bad behavior, 
you easily will be able to complete that list. And also they were objects of the common education of damming in bodily fluids. Bodilies violently laid dry, whereas lust, sexuality, erotisms are, or at least can be, forms of fluidity. So it was no big surprise to me to discover what had kept them from becoming lifelong inhabitants of psychiatries or homes for non-educatable children. It was the bodily training in the military drill, which most of them report to have loved, to give them a sort of body borders from the outside. A muscular body armor by painful actions will, after a while, for them, turn into some feeling of security within the own body, reborn out of the pain principle armed with a muscle armor. Whenever threats from the outside or the inside or the fuzzy mixture of both get too strong, over flooding, engulfing their sources have to be eliminated totally. So Robert Bowers, shortly, the guy who in the Pittsburgh synagogue killed 11 members of Hayes, Hebrew Immigrant Help Society, he didn't say when caught by the police, I hate Hayes and the way they are helping Jewish immigrants. He said, all Jews should be dead each and every, totally. Before that day, there will be no feeling of being whole in a whole world, made a whole world by his act of killing. Uncertain body borders. Margaret Mead has shown how people of that special stature feel their own body borders to be congruent with the outer borders of their country. They need the idea of strongly sheltered borders of their countries to stabilize the borders of their own body country. So refugees crossing German borders, let's say in Bavaria, step directly right away into the body of an inhabitant of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, who perhaps has never seen a refugee in his life. And he'll cry for help against the intruders. Fears and hatred against dangerous intruders usually are strongest there where there are very few or even none immigrants. That's a sure sign for fragmented body people dominating the scene. The result, fascism is not in first line a special ideology. It's a way of organizing reality after the demands of people with certain body structures who all the time work hard for gaining political power in their countries so that they can get into positions who will allow them to form society after their bodily demands. Male people, their main tool of forming violent acts, suppressing all forms of free femininity and the other forms of free behavior all around them. So that I would have thought without several actions in the last years that could have been a thing that is historically um, gone with women in new, in new roles in, sometimes in places of, um, of power, in dealing with men in institutions and so on and so on, that this should have declined. But <clears throat> what actually is the case is writing about right-wing populists of the moment in the US Trump time, a German journalist, Angela Nagle, says, in the center of right-wing populist talk, there still is the woman as the main object of hatred. Ever and ever again, der Dauerbrenner. She finds lots of rhetorical slogans of that kind of those ugly internet platforms of the alt-right people. There is an omnipresent hatred of the female body giving birth to new children, <clears throat> no matter if they are black, Hispanic, or white trash. There still are heaps of men who seem to live in heavy fear of uncontrolled reproduction, especially of Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Muslims, white trash women in search for sexual orgies, an unbearable slimy mass of whores of all colors in which the normal single white male individual is threatened to be engulfed, swallowed up by an unsecure ground. 
For example, the stand-up comedian Bill Hicks performing male fantasies live on stage. On stage. In the fictitious voice of a female inhabitant of a caravan, he lets her say, oh, have a look on all my wonderful little miracles here, balm. In my cabin, it's so narrow as in a can of sardinas, balm. You know which would be the real miracle? If I would remember the name of your goddamn father, Baum. Think I, think I have to call you Trucker Junior, Baum. And there's your brother, Pizza Boy Junior. And there the next one, Vermin Exterminator Junior. And there's the next one, Working for a Meal Junior, Baum. Which means all the people who are in the lower positions of society are in the right places down there. It's what they have earned by their way of living. It's absolutely clear that the mothers of children in poor dwellings are prostitutes, unprofessional prostitutes, who open their legs for a pizza or a lesser gift. Incarnation of all that lower grades in society is, up to this very day, even in highly technological societies, in the views of the dominant male, especially in the view of the deprived dominator male. The woman, the female body, which pulls man down, especially through her ability of giving birth, giving birth to lives which are absolutely superfluous, lives that are poisonous, and they are supposed to do this from a planfully obsessive mean position, having their wicked fun in letting everybody fuck them who is able to spit some drops of sperm off. The assassinator Alec Manessian, 25, who with a pickup van killed eight women and two men on April 23, 2018, in a Toronto walking zone for pedestrians, is a member, as a Facebook posting says, of the INCEL movement. INCEL is the acronym for involuntary celibacy, gleich unfreiwillige Enthaltsamkeit. Also sie sind unfreiwillig enthaltsam because women are so horrible. One of the many small groups living in some obscure corners of the so-called manosphere. Manosphere is a loosely connected online sphere which is bound together by the core elements of masculinity. All through the writings of these different online forums, the patriarchal suppression, they say, is an invention of militant feminism Real American men live under the dictatorship of political correctness and the commands of cultural Marxism. These, by the way, are exactly the terms Norwegian right-wing killer Anders Bering Breivik used in his internet pamphlet explaining his murders of about 70 young Norwegian social democrats. For America, they say, it's Hollywood and the universities where the party of the Democrats and her followers are working obsessively towards the goal of extinguishing the white race. And ahead of all the rest, it's the white race male who is suppressed on all levels and appropriated in first place. This view of the world appears in online boards running under the names of Incel Me, The Red Pill, or Return of Kings the kings we just heard about. Those kings, having lost their power, come back as assassinators, the last heroes of masculinity, killing plain clothed civilians who just happen to be around. We sure will hit the right ones. I read in the newspapers, they feel themselves as part of a movement calling itself MGTOW, men going their own way. The journalists, Klute Simon, and Karcher report the MGTO view of the ideal woman as they find in the net, quote, she should address me as her master, obey all my orders, she should spare all her lust for me, she should be a virgin before a marriage and ask for my permission in every case she wants to act in. That's the way one user of the platform Reddit describes the woman of his dreams, seine Traumfrau. They are in fear of the sexuality of women who claim to be free to do what they want. After the rules of incel logic, women have to be punished for that. 
So the guys on this platform share their reports of how to rape women and boast when their acts were their acts of sexual harassment. And more, the wish to kill is openly exhibited. In a Facebook post directly before his action, Mr. Minessian named Elliot Roger the assassinator who killed six people and hurt 14 in 2014 near the campus of the University of Santa Barbara, naming him the highest gentleman among us. Elliot is the guy who left to us a manifesto in which he is dreaming of a future where humanity will be liberated from sex. To get to this happy state, there is nothing more to do than execute all women in concentration camps, he stated. The programs of pogrom, programs come <clears throat> to come are completely formulated and exhibited in internet forums. As long as the protagonists of those programs lack the necessary political power, those programs will, will not, cannot be executed, so what is left for them are terroristic acts with or without suicidal result. Those of you who have taken a look into the 1,500 pages internet manifest of the Norwegian terrorist Anders Bering Breivik, who killed 69 young social democrats in the island of Utoya in 2009, could have found there a complete program how to deal with women in Howell. Breivik accuses feminist women to be responsible for the suppression of men by sexual libertinage and their cultural Marxism dominating Norwegian culture. Women, so his program for the victorious future for real Christian men to come, will only be allowed to university after they have given birth to at least two good Christian Norwegian children. It's the state who will care for their education. The highest rank for women in university will be the bachelor grade. They will be forbidden to become professors. They have to be kept out of the army and the police. Breivik proudly states, in the three years before his shooting of the young social democrats, he had no sexual relations at all. It's still the case that in the hidden or even open center of all male terroristic activities in the world, a murderous anti-femininity is glowing. That's a more or less common thing and not new at all. New is another thing. Those traits have got a new relevance through the internet. What we easily had put aside in earlier days as the insane babble of some crazy sectarians, actually in our days has got a heavy weight importance through the net and it becomes noticed worldwide. One million likes for the anti-feminist hate speech you create there, and within a single miraculous, miraculous moment, you are no longer an isolated hating person somewhere whom nobody knows and wants to know. You are active part of a massive empowerment of yourself and the groups you think you belong to. In the view of German AFD, Angela Merkel is not just a bad chancellor, she is a wicked witch. Things of that kind get a new sort of relevance because of their public electronic platforms. Okay, there are some moves against them. Some people, Amazon and so on, try to put them out and, uh, from their pages, um, but uh, <clears throat> doesn't work. The point is, who's ready to kill or feels himself or herself bound to kill. There you find the sure fascists, whatever ideology they spread around them. Ideology is nothing, it's just words, words that are exchangeable. The real difference between fascists and non-fascists is their different bodily attitude to killing. You can check this all over, all over the world in all different political systems and situations. Whatever they call themselves, where killings and mass killings happen, you have the material tracks of fascism, of whatever status or color. Killing is the main fascist pleasure. Biggest pleasure is extermination as a program, whether insects, viruses, or Jews, or liberal Democrats. Out of the way with them. 
to hell with them. Where killing is on the schedule, there is the promise of fun. Extermination is the highway to happiness. Jewish, Jewish author Ruth Klüger, who survived Nazi concentration camps, extends this to become a definition of the very nature of the humankind when saying, cats are scratching, dogs bite, humans kill. For the humans not yet fully born, being torn apart in their body fragmentation, filled up with hatred up to the borderline of their lips, her perception uh, probably is true. So just no, some sentences to the book, um, The Laughing of the Killers, uh, that Toby mentioned. And uh, it's a sort of extension uh, of those things I try to describe in male fantasies for more modern times. and. Uh, the point is that whether looking at the killings of the communists in Indonesia in 1965, of the killings through uh, um, soldier, uh, children soldiers in, in Rwanda and uh, Guatemala and uh, death squads and um, other places, uh, Chile, Argentina, South America, and wherever, wherever you take a closer look, um, you have uh, not only this uh, fear or um, objection of women, uh, you really find this, this moment of laughter. And, um, and uh, Anders Breivik, uh, when killing a 14 year old girl uh, with a gun uh, near bringing it to her head, and you see he wants to see the bloody mass, and he's laughing, and he's shouting with laughter, and, uh, and People who uh, survived, uh, young people who survived the situation, said he was he was jubileeing like uh, like a football player uh, making a goal when when sh when making his shooting. So, and uh, what is it about this this laughter? You know, there are millions of ways of laughter and, and laughing, but uh, why do they get uh, into the state of laughter? Uh, when killing and, okay, they get into power and the place is empty, they feel whole, all that. Um, but I think of the very special thing with laughter, with this heavily laughter, especially in groups, um, is uh, that uh, laughter leaves no, uh, no space for any other feeling. Laughing and uh, puts uh, and the body is choking with laughter completely. And uh, especially the, the das brüllende Gelächter, which we know from Bierzelt until uh, up to meetings of SS people and so on. And the people in Rigoberta Manchu describes in the Guatemala killings of uh, so-called guerrillas. And she says, and they, they often call it fiesta. The killing is, is fiesta, and uh, the laughing puts them together. They are sure they cannot be punished because it's their authorities which command them or allow the killings. That's a very important point for Breivik too. He is allowed to do everything because he is acting for Christianity and against Islam, and no worldly court has uh, the power to, to judge him. And for all of those, they are what I called, it's their entering the sphere of a free, unpunishable criminality, godly criminality, and the fiesta moment they enter it is in their laughter. There, so there we deal, we have to deal with people in the world who get to the feeling of being free by killing. Good. So thank you, Klaus Tevelite, uh, for your talk here. Uh, we have so many questions, but the time has advanced a little bit. Let me just ask one, maybe, and uh, then open it up for the public. I'm sure you have many questions as well. Maybe we can talk into intermission a little bit more, or maybe tonight when we have a dinner. When you describe that sort of male fascist personality or the body of it, or the fear of overflowing, 
And uh, the body armor of it, you, uh, in the Breivik book you did, uh, for sure, talk very concretely about bodybuilding as well. I mean, it's a very concrete armor. It's not a metaphorical armor. It's a concrete armor. It's muscle, right? Um, but nowadays, I go to the gym too. Many people go to the gym, and uh, I wonder if um, the sort of feminization of bodybuilding, to talk in cliches, I mean, there's many men pumping up, actually doing, going to the gym many times, um, a week that they pluck their eyebrows, they take great care in facial hair, and uh, um, Breivik has this sort of meticulously uh, uh, ridiculous beard almost. That is, like, It takes a lot of work to do this kind of beard, right? Um, and I think this is maybe that something changed a lot if you like compare a Freikorps soldier uh, from the 20s to um, a bodybuilder today, it's a t totally different concept of femininity or masculinity or gender altogether. And I wonder, does this sort of conform with your argument um, uh, of the body in the fascist personality or does it contradict it? Or is it just yet another way of sort of internalizing what is perceived as the other on the body? Mm -hmm. It's on. Okay, it's on. <laughs> if we go back be before World War I, the officer wow. of, the, uh, and, uh, of the army, and uh, he, was, he was like that. He was the elegante Leutnant, not uh, with a corset, not, uh, not uh, no. showing. <laughs> no belly shown, so yeah. that corsage is back then. <laughs> Why yeah, don't we have that today? Uh, look at Schnitzler and so on. Uh, these guys, uh, they were very much looking and, uh, after Äußeres. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, the idea, uh, so they wanted it to be uh, every girl uh, was thought to love a lieutenant, a young lieutenant like that, in the uniform and as a, as a very beautiful man. And, uh, okay, Bra Breivik says uh, he uh, complains the feminization mm -hmm. of society. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, he, when he's going um, into the gym, and he that does it every day, he describes it in his, in his manifesto. And uh, he does it not the reason you uh, do that. Uh, I didn't talk about my reason, but... <laughs> you, 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 yeah, I, I, I guess. <laughs> That, uh, that you will not grow too fat, let's say like that, and your belly and uh, be seen. Bra I don't want to get a Hexenschuss, but that's another yeah, okay. story, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but Breivik does the opposite, uh -huh. and he will not get a belly, but he will get weight. Yeah, once again, weight, yeah, it's yes, a different sort of He culture, says he, he's on, on uh, is weighing every, every day, and uh, every weeks and so on, and, and uh, writes it in, into his diary, and says, I started with about 87 uh, kilo, and now I'm at uh, 93. So by training, he put, uh, that means uh, power, muscular power, not fat. Yeah. No, he goes there t to get muscular power in exactly this armor. And he, and he says, uh, he has the plan to do the, his assassination in, on a special day, and he writes, I hope to that day I will be at 95. Um, kilo, and he says, I'm uh, completely, and uh, my body was never as good as now. I feel the strength, uh, uh, God-like strength before it's he, before him, he yes. goes mm -hmm. to killing, yes. Uh, so, and uh, what uh, in earlier times were the army and the drill there, uh, some people do like that in, in those uh, mucky buden or training centers or so on, and Breivik is one of them. And he really, when getting on this way, he starts uh, being a sexual uh, person, which he was before. 